Good morning, church. That's awesome news. Um, I was saying before that I would rain out to build a youth building. <laughs> Mike is like, now that's your problem. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, Christ is risen. Amen. So let's dive into today's scripture. It is in Matthew 28, 1 to 20. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, as his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel, the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, now they have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they'll see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. When the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you to the very end of this age. Amen. As we think about what Easter is, may we open up our hearts. And may this day not be just another Sunday. But may we be touched by the power and the joy of Easter. Let's pray. God Almighty, your love and mercy for this world is unmatchable. The suffering you went through for our sake is unthinkable. But here we are, freed by your sacrifice, alive and able to celebrate the full joy of Easter. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place, to die in our place. When we deserved punishment, you showed us mercy. When we rejected you, you patiently pursued us. And when we betrayed you, you asked for us to be forgiven. Thank you, Lord. Right now, prepare our hearts as we get ready to receive your word. Challenge us to do better. Encourage us to answer your call and be with Pastor Mike as he shares what you put in his heart to speak to us today. And we pray in the name of Jesus, and we all say, Amen. Amen. Who is Jesus? Why cannot we escape him? He only lived 33 years. He never traveled more than 100 miles. He never had any formal education. And yet 2,000 years later, an entire generation is talking about Jesus Christ. And I'm part of that generation that's going to talk to you about Jesus today. Are you happy about that? Yeah. Amen. 
So I do, before I speak it, I want to share with you um, a reminder to go look at some of the fantastic testimonies, because I think it's always important for us to hear others testify to Christ. And this week, these five members of your church, some of which were at the earlier service, a couple of which are in here right now, gave testimony to their faith in Christ. I think the longest one's 15 minutes, so it doesn't really take a ton of your time. Um, but go on to uh, Marion Methodist, hit the Watch Live button, and you can scroll down to, to the date you want to watch. Or um, you can go on our YouTube channel and they're there as well. Uh, fantastic uh, testimonies. Years and years ago, when communist Russia was just becoming a communist country, there was a leader known as Bukharin. And Bukharin stood in front of 10,000 people. And his job that day was to extol the virtues of uh, socialism and communism. And his goal was to crush the people's belief in the Christian faith. And so at length he went on, and when he finished, he thought for sure that the crowd that he had rendered silence, in and among them were the ruins and the burning rubble of their Christian faith. And he left in his mind to great success and walked off the stage. But as he was walking off, a little man, an old man, simply followed him across the stage and stopped at the microphone, stood in front of the masses gathered there, and simply uttered the old ancient Eastern Orthodox greeting saying, Christ is risen, is, risen is what the whole congregation said back to him. You cannot defeat our Lord Jesus Christ. So during our Easter message, there will be a number of times when I extol that greeting and you're to respond as these did. So when I say, Christ is risen, you say? He is risen. Now don't be weak about it, you know. We can do the patty cake Christianity if we want to. But we got up and came to Easter morning worship because he is our Lord. So as we begin, and stay with it as long as you possibly can, um, we're going to celebrate the fact that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is indeed. Now today, there are 2.6 billion people in the world that claim our diverse worldwide faith. We are a church that spans the whole globe. As a matter of fact, though, because of our diversity, we don't even agree that the same creeds are the most important creeds in the church. We don't even sing the same music. Heck, in a couple hours ago, there was a whole different form of music that happened in here. And the group that came to that ascribes to that and thinks it's wonderful. And I pray you thought what we did so far this morning was wonderful as well. And not only that, but Jared led us in the Lord's Prayer. And I don't know if you know this, but we don't all agree with the same words in the Lord's Prayer. Are we supposed to say trespasses, debts, sins? We're not sure. We can't even as a church, or don't even as a church, celebrate Easter on the same day. Did you know that? Orthodox Church doesn't celebrate Easter until May 5th. A lot warmer at the egg hunts those days, right? <laughs> but yet, with all that diversity, red, brown, yellow, black, and white, different cultures on the inhabited continents, every single Christian everywhere agrees on one central fact. Christ is risen. risen I mean, there's three things I want to say about that today. First, Easter is about the gospel, not innovation. Easter is about the gospel, not innovation. I've been by as a pastor Easter many times. And I have to tell you, as a pastor, it is a challenge to yield from telling my favorite stories. It, it is hard to not tell my favorite Easter stories to you this morning. I love to tell you the story about the time I brought a BB gun in church uh, because there was a balloon that got away from us before Easter Sunday, and I wanted to get it down. But I'm not going to tell that story today. I'd love to tell you the story about this famous painting that's called Checkmate, but then a master uh, looked at it and said, no, it's wrong. The king has one more move, and I'd like to speak Jesus into that. The king has one more move, but we have no time for that today. I would love to tell you the story about how... The dad grabbed the bumblebee and squished it in his hand and pulled the stinger out of his hand, showing his son, who is deathly allergic to bumblebees, uh, stings that death has sting is taken away. And I'd like to equate that to Christ, but I can't do that. We have no time for that today. I'd love to tell the story about how at Churchill's funeral, rather than playing taps, and he demanded they play Reveille because at our death we all rise. But I don't have time. You go, Mike. <laughs> Who could have guessed I would? 
Those are some really inspiring stories, and I can tell them well, and I've told them before, but I'm not going to tell them here. Today, I'm just going to focus on the gospel and no innovation. I'm just going to tell the truth, which is simple. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Indeed, he has. And so let's drop ourselves into the garden of Matthew 28 that Gonzo read about just a couple of moments ago. Mary and the other women get up early on the Sunday morning, and they go to the tomb. To look at what? What did they think they were going to see there? You know, I can only imagine, since you and me have been a little bit involved in watching basketball on TV the last few weeks, I can only imagine that they were going to kind of go to the tomb and act like those people that have just those kids that have just spent a year or so trying to get to a certain moment, but were denied victory, and they just kind of stand on the court and look at the scoreboard and gaze around like, what now? All they know for sure is that whatever they've been involved in, it's done. But as they get there, there's this violent earthquake, and an angel appears, rolls the, bed, the stone away, and sits on it. And I think it's always important for us to understand how graves were. It wasn't like when we talk about rolling the stone, it's not like the Indiana Jones big marble running after you. It's more like a wheel that seals a doorway. And so the angel's probably sitting 10 feet up off the ground. And they say, the scripture says, he looks like lightning. His body looks like the lightning that we had here Friday night. And his clothes were as white as snow. That's what's going on. So you got the women, you got the angel, <clears throat> but don't forget the guards. The guards, what do they do? They just fall out. They shake and tremble and fall down like dead men. Like dead men, they're not dead. And what's exciting and interesting about this is that you have the most decisive event in human history not described. The resurrection of Jesus is not described at all. The stuff all around it, the garden tomb for sure, the guards, the angel, the women, but the actual resurrection has no description in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It doesn't tell us what happened, just the fact that he was alive. There is not a single human witness, not one. There's not one single narrative, not one, to, the, to what happened in that tomb. It is till this day a mysterious work of God. And the stone is rolled away, not so Jesus can escape like we have in Hollywood. I'm out, yeah, ta-da. That's not why the stone's rolled away. Stone's not rolled away to let Jesus out. The stone is rolled away so that we can get in and see that the grave has nothing for us. Amen. And the angels then state this simple fact. The angels speak to the woman. He says, I know why you're here. These are my words, not scriptures now. You came upon the mission to gaze on the grave of a dead man, to grieve, to dream of what could have been that's all washed away. But I got to tell you, you're wasting your time because he's not here. He's risen just like he said he would. Go ahead, take a moment, but don't linger. You go and tell his disciples to meet him in Galilee like he told you to. And so the women hurry away. They, they run full speed. They're filled with unspeakable joy, and Jesus intercepts them, and they fall and worship. And if you're taking our growth group books, there's this painting inside that growth group books, which seems like it is the natural response you know, to the moment that's happening. They're running to tell the disciples that Jesus was alive again and they encounter the living Christ. So why is worship their first response? It's pretty simple. Christ is risen. I agree with you. He has. He commands them to go and tell. And the women and the angels and Jesus are all doing their role. But what about the guards? See, these, these people are not alone in the garden. So we, we revert in the story Gonzo read back to the guards. What happened to these guys? Well, the guards go and tell the truth. They go to the Roman leaders, to the, 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 the uh, leaders of, of their religion, and they say, well, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, but an angel stone, no guy in the tomb. And the leaders all uniformly said, yeah, we have a problem with that story. We have a really big problem, so here's what you're going to do. 
You're going to save your own lives because, of course, letting a prisoner free would have cost them their life back in their day. This is how you're going to save your own life. You're going to lie. You're going to say that his disciples came by, his followers came by, they rolled the soon away, they stole his grave, his, his body. What happened to it? We don't know. They're commanded to lie to save their lives, and they do. They absolutely lie and tell everyone that Christ was stolen. But here's the fact of the matter. The Christians never did believe them because what they knew was that Christ had risen. He is risen indeed. And so the 11 disciples, they run up to Galilee, which isn't just a minute or two. It's a little bit of a walk. And they fall at Jesus' feet when they, he encounter, they encounter him and they worship him. And here's one of the things that make the gospel, to me, the truth. It says, when the disciples encounter the resurrected Lord, they fall down in worship. Some believe, some doubt. Now, if you're trying to convince people that something's the truth, why would you admit in that story that some people are doubting? That seems human. Doesn't it seem human for some of us to not believe what our eyes and our ears are seeing and hearing? I mean, if you really wanted to get your story straight, you'd cut down all this Matthew, Mark, Luke, John stuff, get one story of his birth, one story of his resurrection, one story of all the stories in between there. But the Gospels presented us like eyewitness accounts. And even right now, some of you are seeing me from here and there and over there, and some of you are seeing me through their cell phone on Tuesday afternoon. We all see things differently. And Jesus then, on that hill in Galilee, speaks with the full authority of the Trinitarian God. And he commands the, disciple, the once disciples, now apostles, to transform the world, to go make disciples everywhere. And they do. There's 2.63 billion of us today. There was only 11 that day. Think about that. And he affirms that baptism is a symbol of belief. Whether you have a sprinkling baptism like we do or like many churches or sometimes we do full immersions, the point is get the people wet in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he promises his eternal presence with humanity and they fearlessly, they fearlessly trust him. 2.63 billion people 2.63 billion of us today speaking every language of every skin level of melanin that you can possibly think of completely affirm the most potent truth of all time. Christ is risen. Is risen. I'm with you. And secondly, <clears throat> Easter's about in invitation, not information. I spent a lot of time in the early portion of my ministry doing what's apologetics, what's called apologetics. That means seeking to prove the truth of Easter. And I can do it, by the way. I can, take, I can take the Bible and set it aside, and I can make a really reasoned argument using just archaeology, just history, and just witness testimony of those that were not Christians. But it's not about information today. I did send a letter earlier this uh, month that has some of that in there, and if you want it, I can email it to you. But that's, we're not about that. Realistically, the most powerful proof of the resurrection is in the resurrected disciples. The, the disciples spent the rest of their lives proclaiming Christ alive without any payoff from a human perspective. They, they didn't get anything back from that. Most of them were martyred, as a matter of fact. They were convinced be, be, be beyond any shadow of a doubt that they had seen Christ alive. Alongside several hundred other witnesses, these same 11 disciples who had denied who had doubted, who had scattered for the trial and the crucifixion, were now believers. And they go to the end of the earth telling everyone, because this is what they know, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. So Easter is an invitation to believe. Easter is God's decisive, redemptive power expressed as an invitation sent directly from the empty grave to my heart and to your heart. And my prayer for all anywhere who I've ever met and those beyond the ones that I'll meet, those that even just join us online and never will be in our business building is to receive that information, that invitation, not information. You know, I received my invitation on Easter Sunday. 
It's 45 years ago. I don't know if it was 45 years ago today, but it was 45 years ago, Easter Sunday. I was a sophomore in college, and I want to tell you this. It wasn't the first time I heard the invitation. I grew up in a family that went to church, and I always say, and I've said this at every membership class I've had at Marion Methodist, in regards to church, I had a drug problem. I was drugged to Sunday school, drugged to church, <laughs> drugged to youth group. And I enjoyed being there because, A, my family was, being there, was there at church, and a lot of my friends were there. But as far as doing anything other than learning the story, I mean, I learned the stories of the prodigal son, the Good Samaritan. I knew the story about Jesus' birth, baptism, um, transfiguration, and, of course, death and resurrection. I knew those stories, but they really had not penetrated my heart. It just seemed like the right thing to do, even though in my first two years of college, my activity and behavior would have appeared to anyone watching at all to say, well, that guy is not involved in the church because mostly I spent my time drinking beer, smoking weed, chasing around, playing sports. That's what I did. And so one Easter morning, I was fortunate enough to, to, uh, to, to play small college athletics. And so one Easter morning, when a small college is devoid of most students except softball players and baseball players and maybe a few tracksters and kids that were not from our country, I was sleeping. Six o'clock in the morning, and I guarantee you I had been out late or early, depending on how you watch your clock, the night before. And I hear this on my door. Wake up, we have Easter worship. And I'm like, yeah, good. No. Again, five minutes later. Wake up, Mike, we got Easter worship. Dang, they know it's me in here. <laughs> and about 15 minutes later, they came back with pots and pans. Bang, 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 bang. Mike Morgan, wake up. Get out here. Come to Easter worship. Yeah, okay. So I got up, got dressed in relative terms, went down to Crane's Pond, which was a, a block and a half, two blocks from campus, which is normally where we had kegs of beer and um, not church, right? And this guy, um, there were about 20 of us there, so not a crowd. There are about 20 of us, and there's this guy named Sterling Bolden. And Sterling was 100 pounds heavier than me, and I played sports with him as well, and he was six foot six, uh, not a preacher, spent his life as a middle school principal in inner city Chicago. But Sterling had taken, and I love talking to Iowa congregations about this because he took two pieces of barnwood, and I don't have to explain what barnwood is, right? And he'd formed it into a cross and jammed it into the ground. And then he started giving a talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And all the way through, I'm thinking, I know all this information. I know everything he's going to say, and I probably could say it better than him because I don't stutter and spurl around. And I remember thinking, this is, by the way, the height of uh, arrogance, right? But at the end of the talk, it wasn't very long, probably only 20 minutes. You know, it was so cold, our feet were soaking. It was, you know, the dew was like this deep out there. A couple girls sitting on a blanket. The rest of us were just standing up while Sterl talked. But at the end of his talk, Sterl did the most interesting thing. He went over to that cross. He's a big man, very strong man. And he grabbed it with his hand. And he just snapped it like that, and a piece of wood broke off in his hand. And he went to the girl that was standing beside me, and he put it in her hand <coughs> gently. <coughs> and he says as he looked right in her eyes, he said, what are you going to do about Jesus? And he went back to the cross, another piece, all the way around. It was about the third person around, I thought, well, I'm last, so when he gets to me, we can go. He goes all the way around. The cross is starting to not look like a cross anymore because he's breaking all the pieces of it off. He breaks off another piece, and he gets to me, and he comes over, but this time, not like the girl he did beside me. He slams it in my hand. And he says, what are you going to do about Jesus? And I don't know what all the rest of them have said, but he said it once to them. So they probably said something. I might have said amen and started backing up. And this brother locks in on me. He's got both my wrists now. And he's looking straight in my eyes. And he says, Mike, what are you going to do about Jesus? And then as you might have surmised from his background, <clears throat> Sterling was an African-American. And then he dropped into this Baptist thing that he'd had when he was growing up. Mike, what do you know about Jesus? <clears throat> he does that about four or five times. And then he 
I felt like I was kind of a hostage there. But he let me go. And I stepped back, got my little piece of wood. Wish I still had it today. Probably threw it in the ground on the way home. I don't know. But I got back to the dorm, and I'm soaking wet, you know, halfway up to my knees because, you know, it was Easter morning in Iowa outside. And I sat down on the bed, because now it's like 7 o'clock. It's two hours before breakfast. Batting practice is not till 11. So now what am I going to do? I'm wide awake. I'm freezing, soaking wet. But I started thinking about it. I said, what am I going to do about Jesus? And then I did something I don't think I'd ever done in my life before outside of a church service. We always sat in my family to pray or laid in our bed and prayed. I got down on my knees and put my head on my own bed. And no offense to seven-year-old girls, I started crying like a little girl because I realized that my life was not sufficient, that my life was not pointed the way the Lord Jesus would have me go. And at that moment, I asked him to become my Savior, which he kind of nudged me and said, I already am. But I received him as my Savior that day because it was the first time that I had seriously responded to Christ in any way and I knew at that moment that I was a Christian that I was his and so that question now comes to all of us what are you going to do about Jesus I know maybe on Easter Sunday you just came for a blessing not a challenge but what are you going to do about Jesus we can make this way more complicated than it is if we want to but it's not more complicated than that. All we get at Easter is an invitation to believe that Jesus Christ has descended from heaven, became a human being, is the firstborn from the dead, ascended to heaven, <clears throat> and now calls all of us to receive him as our Lord, the Lord of our lives, and respond to him in faith. And if we do, if we do that, if we live in our lives everything about us, that Jesus is ours, then for sure Christ is risen. He is. And so Easter is about action, thirdly. Because, of course, when Sterling asked me, when Sterling asked me the question, what are you going to do about Jesus? That wasn't a what am I thinking about? What do I hope about? It was what am I going to do about Jesus? So I pledged to do stuff about Jesus in my life. And the first thing I needed to do is be unashamed because I'd always kept my faith behind me. You know, in the dormitories in my generation, in, in the 19, whatever that time was, right? We kept that behind us. We, we might have had it in here, but we really didn't want everybody else to know. We didn't, certainly didn't want to behave the way we were behaving and say, hey, I'm a Christian because, of course, we were and would have been branded as hypocrites, but only because it was true. But at that moment, but at that moment, I began to read the scripture and I came across this, this Bible verse that I needed to be unashamed about my faith in Christ and I've put this in as my life verse and if I was going to get a tattoo and I'm not, this is what it would be. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And that morning and this morning I am and was fully convinced that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And, and there is a time for me when I can no more, like my Bible school teachers told me, to hide it under a bush. I have to say, hide it under a bush. No, and absolutely not. There's no more wandering. If I was a child of God, there's no more wandering. If you're a child of God, there's no more wandering whether or not I'm destined for my eternity with Christ because I was and I am. And everything in my life since that moment, my marriage, my raising of children, my leading churches has been pointed to one thing and that is to live my life towards Jesus. Of course forgiveness is always necessary because I'm a knucklehead. <laughs> Only knuckleheads are laughing right now. <laughs> and there were a lot of you. And we know that. But when you receive Christ then you are told by the resurrected Jesus on the mountain, go tell everyone. I found this scripture some time ago. Well, it's always been there, but I found it. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer. That's one of the things that I love about the faith is I have an answer for why I'm a Christian, why I have my hope in Christ. It's in my quiver. All I need is somebody to ask me one question and I'll direct it right straight at their heart but always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have but do this with gentleness and respect because here's what you need to know and you already know it 
but I want to affirm it. You have to be willing, if you're a Christian that shares their faith, whether it's in a Lenten moment or somewhere else, to accept rejection. And to accept the rejection of Jesus' message. They're not rejecting you. They've asked you a question, or they know you, or they've plugged in to you. But one of the hardest facts that I know about life is that not everybody wants a Savior. Not everyone wants any part of Jesus. No one wants to, not everyone wants to do what is required of a disciple of Christ. So, of course, let me bring it home in these last two minutes before I bring the praise band up here. The question is, what can you do about Jesus? And it starts with your answer is simply living faithfully, to have an unashamed faith, to point everything in your life towards Jesus. Now, I admit that some of you are going to need an overhaul. I did. I had to put a whole lot of things, some things I really, really enjoyed, to live out my life as a Christian. Some of you need an overhaul. Some of you just need some maintenance as to what you had before. But we need to have a mindset to tell people how Christ impacted your life and how he will do the same for them and everyone. It's not that hard. You guys don't need to have a 45-minute sermon. You can say in a minute what Christ means to you. You can say in 30 seconds how and why he changed your life. Questions will follow, of course. But that's how the church has grown to 2.63 billion people today. Fearlessly, we need to go forward knowing that rejection is possible, inviting others not just to worship, but to meet Jesus and understand that when you're rejected, it's not you that's being rejected. It's Christ. You're just a pipe delivering his message. Robin Hendricks, in one of our Lenten moments, finished with a Bible study she has tattooed on her wrist. But it's really where we go as Christians from Easter morning forward. It goes like this. Rejoice in the Lord and trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not in your own understanding. In all of your ways, submit to him. And you can submit to Christ everything that you do. You can point yourself to him and be unashamed of your faith for one simple reason. And that is Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray today for the reception of your biblical message of the empty tomb. We know, Lord, that you rolled that stone away not so Jesus could escape, but that we could come in and witness the fact of his resurrection and live with you now and forever. We ask, Lord, that we might receive the invitation to, re to, to allow you to be the Lord of our lives or to renew our relationship, even on Easter Sunday. Yeah, we might have been thinking about eggs and bunnies and, 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 and all kinds of whether we're going to make ham or not, but today, Lord, is truly and honestly about an invitation to receive you and to go forward from this place and wherever at else it is that we're encountering this worship service to live for you in the world. We pray these things because we believe that central truth and tenet of the faith. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Amen. Amen.